Hello, and welcome to the Coralosophy Podcast. My name is Chris Muntz, and this is a little bit of a spring break episode. I would like to talk to you about something that I think is really important. I am in my car, though, because I am behind on life like crazy. Just got back from an actual spring break where I tried to do something uh, crazy there, too, which is to not do very much work. And that means that I need to uh, create a podcast episode this week for you that is a little bit different. There is something that I think is going on uh, in our linguistic space, meaning words that we choose to use. And there is also something going on in the educational space that I think is worth discussing. There is a new term. Uh, It's not a new term. It's just one that's being used a lot more lately uh, that I've started to hear. And it's called trauma-informed pedagogy. My ears perk up whenever I hear the word trauma being used, partly because I'm sensitive to it because I was a, uh, a victim of several types of trauma as a child, okay? And so when I hear people talking about how that applies to students in a classroom as a teacher and as someone who experienced trauma as a child, I my ears perk up uh, as, they, as they would. And, and the type of trauma that I... Um, have experienced. I don't know if I want to talk about it on the show. I might talk about it on the Patreon in more detail. I just don't feel comfortable going fully into it. Uh, but what I, uh, the reason that's interesting to me is because one of the things that I have been aware of for quite a while is that the word trauma itself has been used a lot more in the last several years than ever before. In fact, I'm sitting here in my car. I've got an article in front of me on my iPad. Uh, from psychologytoday.com, and it's called Five Myths About Trauma. And then the subtitle is Debunking Some Serious Misconceptions About an Increasingly Popular Concept. So when we say increasingly popular, this is I'm going to link this in the show notes so that you can see it. Despite its increasingly popular, increasing popularity as a topic, many people still hold some serious misconceptions about what trauma actually is. So I'm looking at this graph here of word usage. I don't know if you've ever seen this where you can go and on Google and look at like in literature and in published literature, how often uh, the word, a certain word is starting to appear. And we're looking at like a 1900s way down on the bottom of the, the graph, hardly ever used and all the way up to a just a rapid shoot upwards in around 2000, 2005. So here are some of those myths. Myth, trauma is a one-off horrific event that changes you forever. Not trauma. That's not what trauma is. I'm not going to go, by the way, all the way into all these because I want to put the article in the show notes and you can look at them. I'm just going to pique your interest at some things that trauma is not. Okay, another myth that trauma leads to PTSD. It actually, most of the time, doesn't. Uh, Trauma about 10% of the time leads to PTSD. And there are certain types of trauma that have a higher percentage. Uh, For example, violent types of trauma um, are the higher percentages, and that's about 20% uh, of people that experience those trauma are, uh, have it go all all the way to PTSD. Uh, Another myth is that trauma is always a disorder of some kind. Not not necessarily the case. Um, Myth, trauma has to happen to you directly. It doesn't. And myth, this is the one where I think we get into the pedagogy thing and then the teaching thing that I think is important, is is a myth that trauma changes your brain forever. Now, I thought that one. I thought that one for a while. Um, and I was, I'd kind of bought into that. I actually heard that presented to me in a school district training once, um, about how myth or the, or the myth that trauma rewires your brain in some kind of a way that is, uh, irreversible and, uh, and permanent. So it, it doesn't do that. And so in this part of the episode that I've clipped out with Eric Barnum, I did an episode with him, uh, early on in the podcast run where we talked about the concept of anti-fragility, which is a concept you'll hear us talk a little bit more about, but it's about the idea that humans are actually a lot more resilient than we think we are, and that uh, and that our current culture, with that increase of the worst use of the word trauma, especially in incorrect ways, is a little a bit of a symptom of of how we are thinking about 
in this, um, our, our lack of resilience and, and our, uh, I think maybe another way I could say it is that we're more powerful than we think we are. Um, and so I think a, a choral rehearsal is a great way for people to realize their power, to realize that they are able to do things they don't think they can do. They're able to fight through fears that they uh, didn't think they could fight through. And so this is a really great conversation. And since it's been uh, so long since it's been on the podcast feed, I thought I would use this as this week's episode. And I strongly encourage you to check it out before we get to Eric Barnum and I discussing this back in 2019. Just a reminder, use your Coralosophy checkout code at sightreadingfactory.com, mymusicfolders.com, ryanmain.com, graphitepublishing.com, and more recently, coralosophy.com forward slash voce hyphen vista. And that's V-O-C-E, voce, like Italian, hyphen vista. And you can get some pretty incredible software for you to teach your kids about overtones. And there are examples and samples on that website that I just listed also in the show notes that you can see me demonstrating it in the class. And there's more of that to come of me demonstrating that. So enjoy this look back into the archives of the Coralosophy podcast with Eric Barnum. And I wanted to talk a little bit about ways that you think a couple of issues you touched on, which were passions of mine in the show, could be brought a little bit closer to the classroom. Great. Um, some things that, uh, that the teachers could actually do if they value these things. And one of them... Uh, it was one of your very first episodes, maybe the second or third, which was called the Anti-Fragile Choir, I yeah. think is what you called it. Yep. Um, so I'm, pre- I'm very familiar with uh, Nassim Taleb's um, term, anti-fragility. Um, I'm very familiar with Jonathan Haidt's research in his book, The Amer- Coddling of the American Mind, that talks for a lot about that. It's Great a book. fantastic book uh, for any educator to read or understand. Yeah. Why don't you, since you did a whole pack podcast on it already, just kind of tell my listeners what it means to be anti-fragile. Um, I think even Nassim Taleb did this in one of his talks where he said, okay, just imagine you have a glass cup, okay? And it's on a table and you push it off the table, okay? When it hits the ground and it shatters, which we're all familiar with, that's what's called fragile. The glass is fragile. Now imagine that you had the same glass and you pushed it over the edge. And when it fell, it didn't break. It just hit the ground and was fine. Um, That would be called robust. Uh, It just is, it's robust. It will last. And then imagine though, which is hard. This is, this is what's next. This is amazing and really difficult to imagine. Imagine that after you push the glass over and it hit the ground, it became a better glass. So it did exactly the opposite of break. Somehow it became better. And that's what anti-fragile would be. And is it perfect? No, but it's a good introduction to the, the, the topic. So if you said, if you could push your choir off of a cliff, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> and, and they didn't break, but got better, um, which they I often the, want to do is push all of a my sudden, choir off a cliff. <laughs> yeah, so they all, all of a sudden can sight read when they land. <laughs> okay, no, great. <laughs> sight reading is a wonderful example yep. of sight reading to me is the best and easiest example to make a entity or a community anti-fragile. Uh, do certain things. And the way that I like to say it was inflict harm, which is like do things that it's not about purposefully damaging, but almost thinking about that that way, where you're choosing to do certain things that aren't necessarily a lot of fun, Mm -hmm. but can inflict enough harm to give them a resistance profile to harm. Yep. It is in a weird way like vaccinating, okay? Yeah, vaccinations fact, I, is another wonderful way to think right. about antifragility. I want to add I want to add something to your explanation there with the glass. Great. From yes, earlier. great. Yeah. Um the the reason Taleb decided to make that distinction and try to create that term is because his whole point was we don't have a word for that in English. Yeah. 
We don't have, we have a word for the, the cup that falls off and breaks. We yep. have a word for the cup that falls off the, the, the table and does not break and just stays the same. Mm-hmm. Just that it's, you know, uh, but we don't have a word for something that is broken, damaged, and then comes back better. Yes. But we do have, but we do have things in our universe and our world that operate that way. So his argument is that we need to have a word. Yes. Um, and so the, and the word that he came up with was anti-fragile. So, uh, other examples, the, uh, the immune system, of course, is yes, fragile. Yes. Uh, that human, might be even better, Chris. I think that might be even better. Yeah. Human bones. Yes. Human bones are anti-fragile. Uh, the, in fact, you, um, the, the sight reading example, um, you were just kind of hinting at, I, here's how I would think of it is if, if our, uh, and this was actually my most recent episode, which I made a pretty, uh, forceful uh, took a forceful stand in that episode that we, choir directors have got to stop playing notes for kids. Mm. Got to stop mm-hmm. playing notes for kids. If you are, if they are reading along with someone playing the piano, they are not sight reading. They are following someone, an auditory external uh, driver, right. which in millisecond my, within milliseconds, within, within milliseconds. Right. But right. but our brain, but our brains are smart enough to do that. So yep. so we are following and not reading, and so. The, the, the connection there to me is the human bone one. If you walk around with a leg brace on when you don't need it for five years and then take it off, you will fall because, yeah. because the, during the growth during that five years, the bones were not allowed to uh, un- endure stress by holding up the full weight of your body so they will atrophy. Our, our bones get stronger as we age. They get stronger even if they break and then reheal. Um, yeah, and they're, they're able to reheal. They come back stronger. So, uh, and I love, I love that you tied that to sight reading because that's actually, I, I agree. That's that's my favorite example in choir of uh, ways to create an anti fragile choir is to teach them yes. to read. Yes. So what? Do, and I mean, let me let me just say this again too. What does it mean to practice sight reading? Uh, practice sight reading in a weird way is like adding a vaccine to your body. You know, you're adding something or you're doing something. Does it have any, could you get by without it, without sight reading? Could you do it? Could you do a performance, something amazing without sight reading? Uh, We couldn't do what we do at my school without it. Um, well, I mean, I mean, you could prepare a choir and never practice sight reading, couldn't you? I mean, at you some could. point, you yeah, could. Sure. You would have to. You change. could learn by rote, yeah. or you know, something. You'd have to do less re- less repertoire yes. and different repertoire, and yeah. Mm-hmm. But when you when you sight read or you put yourself to the fire, I mean, that's what sight reading really is. I mean, sight reading is scary. Real sight reading, not like the pansy sight reading, but actual, like when you don't have a net sight reading Mm -hmm. do you know what i mean where it's like you said take the piano away and you've got leaps and bounds and 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 you start to challenge them with interesting stuff like what if you made your choir sight read a bach chorale from the ream schneider every other week or every week you just hand it out hey everybody we're gonna read this not in German, but just on, and you know, whatever, either, mm-hmm. either Sofedge or not. It doesn't, I, I think it would even be fun for you to take away Sofedge and say, can you read this by just seeing it, by just trying and, and failing? That yeah. was the other thing about anti-fragility that matters. It's a, it's a close tie to something we talked about later in our podcast, which is hedonic adaptation, where it's when you fail, you're more capable of handling not only failure in the future, but you're capable of, I mean, you just, it's practice. If you're just practicing, uh-huh. you're practicing getting better as a musician, as a human being, as an, a person that can sing better and take risks and um, read better in the future, everything becomes faster. So that's why sight reading to me is like a vaccine for the future to get, you know, it helps you get better later. Yeah, absolutely. I, I also, th- I see that the anti-fragility concept and philosophy is also very tied to Carol Dweck's uh, growth mindset philosophy. Mm. Um, if, if you ever come across that, it's the, the, the difference between growth mindset and fixed mindset. Are you familiar with that book at all? Not really, no. 
Okay, so I'll have to look it up. It's a psych- she's a psychologist, and she's got about fifteen mm-hmm. years or so of research that went into this one book called The Growth Mindset, and it is um, it's very similar. Her language is not doesn't use anti fragility language. It's just, but it, you can tell that it's different it, or that it's the same in the sense that they both both ideas reward the 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 concept in the learner that you will fail and that that the failure itself is necessary for you to be able to grow. Um, so a, a student with a growth mindset would be somebody who um, whose motto in a rehearsal in our in a choir context would be I've got to learn this music at all costs. Yes. Whereas a fixed mindset person is more likely to say I need to look like I know this music at all costs. Mm. Meaning they it's important for a fixed mindset person to show that they're smart. Mm. Whereas, uh, and so they will avoid failure uh, because they might put themselves in a position where they might not look smart. Um, and so, I don't, you might have come across this too. You've got you're a dad now, right? You've got yep. little, little ones. How old are they? Five and two. Five and two. So Carol Dweck says that you should never praise your children for being smart. Got it. Never. Don't worry, kids. Right. I don't. So she yeah, and she yeah. Her, so the research right. I'm kidding. And and I and I'm mine. Mine are eleven and seven. And I read this book like three or four years ago. And of course, I I I'd been telling my kids when they were when they exib- exhibited smartness. But yeah. after re- after reading this book, I've completely changed my lingo with not only my students but also my bio kids, um, because they the essentially her point was that if you tell a kid that that really cool thing they just did, like sight read this. Bach Corral, yeah, sure, is because they are so such great sight readers. You guys are mm. so smart. You guys, mm. man, it's just amazing that you did that. They will feel good about the compliment in the short term, but then what happens when you put something in front of them that they crash and burn on two days later? That's right. Well, if their success was because their inherent smartness, then their failure logically would it would be because they're, I guess they're not as smart as my teacher said I was. Mm. And whereas if that that first time they nail that bot corral you say something like you guys my goodness that was excellent we've put some work in on this haven't we your 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 this sight reading thing we've worked on this this that yeah 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 yeah. right right right. thank you for your work that Ah. then what you're doing is you're praising the process and that they went through to get to that point and then if they fail because they will at some other thing later then you can go back and talk about what part of the process did we not hit what, what do we need to do for next time and so i i think i, I see ties between that yep. that idea and the, the anti-fragility idea uh where it, it just start you start to become more comfortable in your own skin with failure um and, and let me ask you a question yeah go yeah. ahead let's try this one on for size let's say they sang that corral would you could you say something to the effect of like Congratu- I mean, you can congratulate them for sight reading well. I mean, that's allowed in this, right? Just yep. say, wow, yeah. great job sight reading. Uh-huh. And then you could say something in the effect of, let's try something harder next time. Could you say that? That Yeah, actually, she has a, she has a great one. I laughed out loud at this one because uh, I love it. But she said, if you give a student something that's too easy, rather than talking about how it's too easy because they're so smart, you can say uh-huh. things like, you can say things like, Wow, I'm sorry I wasted your time with that one. Let's let's do something right. that really challenges you, <laughs> right? right? Let me let's get that lead home out and sight read something, <laughs> right? <laughs> Atonal next time. Yeah, no, yeah, that's the, good. That's good. Uh, yeah, I think like, either I like way. That. Yeah, either way. I think um, the main point to the anti fragility thing and this thing is that we shouldn't um, be afraid to. Again, it sounds so bad. I got to change. I got to figure out how to change the language, but inflict harm. And what I mean by that is to give things that are hard. Mm-hmm. You don't, it doesn't have to be candy and lollipops and feel good all the time. That includes, in my opinion, literature, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, and and one, th- another one I was going to say, but sorry, really. Oh, no, you're fine. Would be uh, one way to create an anti fragile choir is to program differently. Just program differently. Program different stuff that isn't necessarily fun all the time. I know it's a big joke to say we got to eat our vegetables, so let's do 
a renaissance piece. <laughs> but no, what if vegetables was uh, some weird Benjamin Britten tune that's really hard to sing? Or what if eating your vegetables was singing a messian? Or or some of the weirder some of the weirder yeah, niche, niche stats sure. stuff. That's right. No, no, no. And you know, there's an accomplishment there. By the way, uh, when they're done and they feel accomplished, they will be more anti fragile. Uh -huh. I remember when I was an undergrad, and the same guy that I was telling you about earlier, um, Paul Brandvik. One of the pieces that we did on that freshman tour was Ives Psalm ninety six six. Some I sorry, somebody's going to know and embarrass me. Um, but it was an Ives psalm, and I hated it. I hated every minute of rehearsing it. I hated our performances of it. Um, it was polytonal, you know? It wasn't, it just, every minute of it, I hated. And I'll tell you, looking back, it's a memory to me, and I treasure that memory now to say, I got, I was better at the end of that. Mm -hmm. And even though I didn't love the sound, I was so much better as a musician and as a, just because I had the opportunity to struggle. I mean, it was a huge struggle for me personally, not only emotionally, but musically. I mean, it was just so hard for me yeah. at the time. And so I, I just want to challenge. I mean, it would be so wonderful to go to a convention and hear more variety and more things happening and uh, people challenging their singers, not, it doesn't mean necessarily to even sing harder stuff. How cool would it be to have a pro choir get up there and do a unison piece? You know, I'm just saying it doesn't have to be that idiotic. I'm just saying it's good to challenge. That was the whole concept of the anti-fragility. Well, yeah. And let's, let's dive into that language that you use too. Cause I, I think you're right that some people would probably be turned off to the concept. If you say you have to harm your students. No, I, and, and, and that's I not what I mean. No, yeah, and I know right. you don't. I, cause I totally understand. I've, re I've read the book. I, I, <laughs> I know what you mean, but let's talk yeah. about that just for the person who doesn't know what we mean. When you say yeah. uh, inflict harm, I think what we're really saying is you are as an educator, Yes. Intentionally putting your students in a position where they are not able to settle into a comfort zone all of the time. Thank you, Chris. That's wonderful. <laughs> because, yes. because we know that if for at any level of learning, if a kid, if a kid or adult student, anyone learning something is not confused a little bit at the very least, they're not learning anything because right. they, if they're not right. confused, that means they're not kind of trying to rethink a concept or a precept or or right. whatever it is. And so in my classroom, this is another area that I think anti-fragility plays into it. I want to see what you think too. In, in my classroom, another area that I have to use these principles is getting very young singers, because my kids start at age 14 at school. Okay. So getting very young singers past that, what is sometimes a crippling anxiety of making any kind of noise in front of anyone. Yeah, and that, and that is uh, the, the high school teachers all that are listening. All, all are probably nodding their head already, and know that that is one of the hardest parts about our job. When uh, yeah. most of the time, the college directors get people when they're at the very least phonating already, whereas a, a fourteen-year-old oftentimes is so scared that, that when they take a breath to have it to make a sound, uh, their vocal folds are literally not even touching. Like, it's, isn't this amazing, Chris? That what you're talking about has nothing to do with singing though. Oh, it's weirdly. all in the head. No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like weirdly, that's what a cor that's what a con conductor has to do is be a psychiatrist. Yes, yes. for weird. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I've and I've seen a lot of conversation about things like that on Facebook groups and different chat, you know, conversation boards with other colleagues. Um, and you mentioned being a contrarian to the profession. And I feel like this is an area where I am a contrarian to the profession also yeah. in the sense that I seen absolutely no reason to hold that kid's hand. So my, my, um, because I care about them, I want them to experience what, it, what it will feel like when they finally just suck it up and do it mm -hmm. because they, and, and, and I've been doing this a long time and I've taught, I've taught now over 2000 students. So my, my sample size is pretty small or pretty large yep. in the sense sure. that I, I've, been inter, I've been interacting with this type of problem now for 17 years. And I, I've seen the difference between 
how a kid reacts when they are told, um, you know, in this class, we sing in front of each other. And then they start crying and they will sometimes have a panic attack. And I think the consensus is, well, that you got to make sure each kid uh, gets to do what makes them feel comfortable. You don't want to make put them in a situation where they might feel uncomfortable. Um, and I'm sitting here thinking, no, actually, I, I am un- I'm trying to make them uncomfortable. Because what, what, they're, what they will then experience is the, an overwhelming sense of accomplishment where they stared at something in, in the face that they feared intensely, even though it's an irrational fear. It's still an intense fear that for a lot of people is real. And then I help them overcome it by giving them no out. And what, what, in my experience over years of doing this is that in almost every case, that fear for my students usually only lasts a couple of weeks at the beginning of the school year. And by the right. time they've, by the time right. they've ripped off that bandaid a couple of times, they are singing in front of each other. They are singing without a breathy, uncoordinated onset. They are sight reading and we all, we do all of our yeah. sight reading acapella. So it's it, that there, there is something to that idea of if you call it harm, you're, ca- you're calling it harm only in the Im- super immediate short term. The, and, no, and when I say it, I meant it in a weird, like the book says, yep. and like, and and in a in a humanity vaccination way. That's what I, and I know that there is. Uh huh. <laughs> I really hope people don't like fixate on that because that's no. we're talking about. Yes, it's just a language semantic issue. And right. you know what's funny about what you were saying though is these kids. And we're still kids, Chris, you and I, and the rest of us listening. We're afraid to be found out to be frauds. That's, Mm -hmm. I think, what we're afraid of. We're afraid to open our mouth and to be seen to be what we really are, which is just faking it until we make it, you know. And the truth of the matter is, is that, that what you're doing is you're exposing them to, yes, take that step, yes. And then what they realize when they open the door is that everybody is a fraud. Mm-hmm. And, and we're all in this together. We're all figuring this thing out together. And the people that would make fun of them are the real problem, you know, in life. Not, not, and so I think that's so awesome that either through incur- like some sort of overt encouragement or pushing them out onto that small stage that's the harm or that's the harm that you're talking about the uncomfortability of that moment it's a stimulant for them to grow that's right it's a vaccine uh, yeah you're putting yep. that is the vaccine mm-hmm. and guess what they become more anti-fragile they become better they they become robust first and then they become better yep. i think yep yeah no it's absolutely true and i think um the the challenge for some teachers, and I think that I think I'm preaching to the choir here by talking to you about this because you've you're kind of on board with the concept. But for those of you listening, maybe who are still aren't sure, I've got a student who's freaking out from an anxiety attack in my classroom who just does not want to sight read, uh, does not want to sing so that other people can hear them, and I don't want to turn them off to singing. Yes. Then, right. then what I would tell that person is I would say in what time frame of their broader life would you like to not turn them off for singing? Because my argument would be that in the short term, by letting them not do the activity that makes them nervous, you will make, give them a better impression in the short term of your class as a choir, Mm. because you will be, you will tell them what they want to hear and they will then say, Oh yeah, he's a cool teacher. He doesn't make me do things when I'm scared. Right. In the short term, you will win that battle, but then they're not going to become a very good singer in almost, in almost every case, because you do have to, singing is a thing you have to practice. You have to physically do it in order to sing it well. And so Mm -hmm. if you go, if you push them through that phase by giving them no, no out, uh, no option, this is something in my, I'm fortunate my guidance counselors support me on this too. So when they cry to the, go to the office and cry because Mr. Muntz made them sing, um, then, then they... (laughs) then they send them right back and say that that's just what you do in his class and yeah. you signed up for it. It's an elective, uh, right. you know, right. that kind of thing. Then, well, then they get through that phase and they they become so much better, usually within sure. a short period of time. 
that that's what hooks them on on the singing experience not not because they were made to feel comfortable it's because they're made to feel powerful right one thing that i might add that mm -hmm. somebody might think is what if somebody has a legitimate uh professionally uh diagnosed anxiety disorder and what i would say is look we're teachers that teach a wide variety of students and we should make we have to be creative in some cases i think we just have to be and that doesn't mean they get a way out i'm just saying that we need to be creative about how to frame things yep we have to be be creative with how to to the timing of things but they still you can do it in a way that still doesn't give them a way out still gives them the vaccination still helps them become anti-fragile even if there's seriously different stakes at play yep. like and so I think you'd agree with that, that there are ways and not every way is everybody's way. And that's OK. I think you as a teacher, that's what you have to do is to be creative. Yeah, no, you're you're exactly right. Uh, I can I can think of, like I said before, out of the couple thousand students I've taught before, I can count on one hand mm -hmm. in all that amount of time, the students that their anxiety was so bad and, and diagnosed uh, anxiety disorder type situations that were never able to get through that little stage with me. Sure, sure. But that's probably two or three kids ever. Yeah. And, and, and hundreds of them, because that's the world we live in now, have some kind of anxiety disorder di um, diagnosis. Yeah. So, so, it, they're, they're, so you're right. It, and so what I've done it, over the years is I've come up with lots of different tricks and li lots of different ways to get them to do it. One, one of them is that I know that for a performance anxiety type situation, in most cases, the biggest moment of fear for a person is right before they sing. It's that, sure. it's that moment like I'm going to take a breath and I'm going to start singing and then everything seizes up because I'm, I'm really afraid. So what I, one of the things that fixes probably 80% of those situations is that I tell them I'm going to stand right next to you and I'm going to start with you. Oh, good. Start singing with you, but then you don't know when. I'm just going to eventually fade out and you're going to keep going. Chris, what you're saying is genius too, because what you're doing is you're saying you're not alone. That's it. That's all you're saying. Yep. I mean, and but it's not like you're not alone. Believe me. Trust me. Trust fall. I'm behind you. It's not that. It's you're literally doing it with them. So in a yeah. weird way, you are holding their hand to a degree. Yeah. But it's like bike riding with a kid. And then I just walk away. You've got your hand on your back, and then you let go. You let yep. go. You yep. let go. Yep. And That's it, and it works That's in great. all, and it works in almost all the cases, the most extreme ones I've ever had to do where I'll tell a kid, you're not getting out of this. You're still going to sing, but you can go and like the door of the classroom, you can go step on the other side of the door, but we, you have to leave it open a crack so we can still hear you. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that fixes the other, that, so the more severe ones that like, I just can't do this in front of people. I'll say, okay, yeah. so what if we could hear you, but we can't see you? Does that okay. make it easier? And sure. in almost all cases, they will. And then, so I know we're not supposed to touch students in high schools, but I, if if a kid's yeah, crying, sure. if a kid's right. crying, I'm gonna yes. I'm gonna touch them. And so I'll come up if they're. It's usually a fr freshman girl, and she's going through her. I usually just have them sing like "My Country Tis of Thee" or something. You know, some something really easy that they that they know, and they'll start crying. And sometimes I'll just go up and kind of link arms. You know, like yeah. the, you're not alone thing. And I'm going to stand right next to him and I, I'll just sing, just sing. So only I can hear you. And which of right. course I know that everybody can hear if they, if, you know, if they're singing right. really softly and, and we do other, you know, group activities where it's like, you know, any, any kind of, if I even smell that you are making fun of each other during this time, there's, this is your warning. You're getting detention. Oh, like, yeah, absolutely. we're going to, we're going to support each other, you know? So I think, what what they're learning in in instances like that is they are learning their own strength, and mm. that's and that's the anti fragile aspect. I think. I just it's I, you know we're talking about this more and more, and I'm I'm just thinking how sad we are at this time where every we're all so self sabotage, where these kids sign up to sing in a choir, <laughs> and they don't want to sing. Mm -hmm. In a choir, in a weird, you know what I'm saying? In a weird well, yeah, way. They'll say, but they'll they, say do. they want to sing with people. They just don't want to sing. But then they don't oh. sing with people either. Right. Right. They hide, right. They hide, their voice yes. hides in the choir. It's yeah. So, oh, yeah. It's tragic. And what I think it's getting worse. 
I yeah. think so. You know, it, it for in, in my experience, I, I don't see that it's getting worse. Actually, okay, good, good, good. But that, but there's other. It doesn't mean that doesn't mean that it's not getting worse. Like on a grand scale, I just we sure. live we live in kind of like a little choir Disneyland where I've got like a, you know, oh yes, Kansas City Disneyland. That's right. Feeder, like That's feeder right. system things where I, you know, I know all the yeah, kids right. before, they, before they come in and right. they've been singing in choirs, like with teachers that I co- collaborate with and we, you know, it's, the, it's a whole thing. So it's really cool. So it, I, I don't see it because we raise the kids to know what they're getting into when they come, you know, yeah, right, to the high school. Right. And, and I, that's, and I'm fortunate and privileged to be in that situation, but so it's, a, but here's what I do see. I, I, I think, the the argument that that kids make when they don't want to sing in front of people is well I signed up to sing with people I didn't sing sign up to sing by myself and then we have to talk about how you're right but in order for me to teach you as an individual which I have a whole another episode on the show sure, about, really right, about sure. finding that individual in the choir I can't teach you unless I know what you sound like right because sure. I can't help you. So if, and so there's plays into that growth mindset. Like there are going to be things about your voice that when we hear you sing, we're going to try to make better because right. they're, 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 that's, but that's why you took the class. You took the class so that my expertise in helping you fix certain things that you don't like about your voice, but I can't help you fix it if I can't hear it. And that's usually where they start to buy into it. It's like, right. oh, it's like, it's like a free voice lesson that that's, that's what it is. And so I think that's that that's paid off for me a lot yep. at the high yep. school level is that idea. Uh, so I encourage people to look into this this concept because there is quite a bit of psychological research behind it. This is not just two guys, Eric and Chris, like ranting about how we should be meaner to our kids. There, there's no, no there's no, quite no. a bit of research that this is what is best for people. Yes, and um, I mean. This is this is one of many subjects that deserve time in your mind. And I and again, one of the reasons we started the and I think this is the reason you started this podcast. It's because we all need to think about this more. Mm-hmm. I, we can't just go into the year and think, well, you know, what spiritual am I going to do this year? I think we need to we need to do other things. We're a start. And what we were finding is that, or thinking about, was that there wasn't, there was just small pockets around of people that were having these discussions. And it would be nice to have, start to try to get these concepts more into the thinking process of people. And that's what you're doing too. Just trying to get people to say, okay, let's go to the next level of thinking beyond. I got to get three today and get home, you know, and, or, and beyond. You know. And it's beyond what's what people will get uh, by going to an interest session at a convention. Let's get right. Right. You right. can't, you can't like it, that. So that's, I believe, and this could also be because I'm getting old now and I've been going to conventions now for so long that I no longer feel like I look at the list of things that are available and see anything that I really would learn anything from. And and that's not an ego thing, that's just a oh I've been to seven of those almost exact same yeah, types of right. sessions before. I, I'm not going to get something new out of that. In fact, I've already been to that same Patty Dewitt sight reading session like five times, so I'm not going to go to that one again. So instead, I'm like at the bar with my friends or whatever. So that exact comment is is proof of what I'm talking about too. Is that yeah. we just aren't thinking about it as a culture as a as a pop, as a genre of music, choral music as a whole, I don't think aren't thinking this way, or there's not enough of us thinking this way. About right. Some of these I would love. I would love for there to be a uh, a body of sessions at a, at, at a national convention where there are uh, in depth philosophical roundtable discussions between people that don't agree mm, mm, yeah sure that's something we I, I don't i don't believe i've ever seen because if if a in-depth philosophical movement in the choral profession is being discussed at a convention which is rare 
But if it is, it's being presented as this is the right answer now. Yeah. This is now how we do it. And, and I think that, you know, the, the beauty of a podcast is that we could, we can bounce back ideas back and forth between two people or three people or four people or whatever it is right, right. and, and have it be productive even if we don't agree on how to apply the the concept or, or whatever. And ultimately that's how, that's the only way you learn. That's right. It, and it's the, weirdly enough, we're meta talking about anti-fragility. We are. We are yeah. by having a conversation, even about not agreeing or something that is the vaccine for mm-hmm. the future as well. Yep. What is that? What is the manifestation of anti-fragility would be, I am more capable of being civil civility i'm more capable of listening um i'm more capable of just being human and also more capable of not arrogantly thinking i have all the answers you know and you said something a second ago though that i want to zero in on because you kind of said it in passing about us as teachers not feeling like we we get we know everything yeah and here's how i would point at that i would point at that by saying we have to be willing as teachers to apply the same anti-fragility mindset and growth mindset to ourselves mm. that we are applying to the students. Because mm. if, if we don't lead by some kind of an example, we also are a weaker example. Right. Uh, so for example, I did, uh, I did an episode, uh, my episode five was called what I suck at. Yeah. So just me talking for 45 minutes about things I suck at. And my students have, I, I, I've, I've been making an effort. So before I even started a podcast, this has been something I've been working on at school. I've been working on talking more openly with my students about things that I feel like I'm not good at in the moment. Guys, if I'm going to be as hard on you as I am, Mm. then I think that it's only fair if you see me learning too. Mm Mm-hmm. Because it's again, like you said it before, it, we we have to show that we're in this that this together. And so I started thinking this was probably two or three years ago, maybe now, where I was standing in front of my most advanced choir at the school. There's probably a hundred voices, and they can all, you know, sight read at a college level. Probably it's this it's this awesome thing. And so there are kids in there that some of them are better music readers than I am because they come in with perfect pitch or they come in having. 10 years of cello experience and they, they have a, a, a musical savant kind of brain. And, and I get these kids almost every year. There are people in here who, who can hear faster than I can if we're in tune or out of tune. So I'm not going to be the gatekeeper this year for those types of things. We're going to lean on her. And then I would also say things like, I I'm pretty good at hearing like whether or not a chord's in tune and I'm pretty good at imagining how a musical phrase should go. And that's Mm -hmm. kind of my, going to be my strength, but I'm not super good at reading like really complicated syncopated rhythms and triplets and tied, tied triplets across a hemiola and all these different things. And, but we've got some drumline kids Mm -hmm. that that can read that rhythm the first time. Right. And when we come across those rhythms, I'm going to have him do it. I'm going to have him demonstrate that. So, so they started, we started this at at my school probably two or three years ago where the kids are just used to it. They're used to me talking about like, yeah, there's still going to be times where I'm claiming to be right about something and there's a disagreement, but, but, but largely they know that I'm willing to say, you know what? Wow, that sucked. I'm, I'm pretty dumb. We're going to try that again. (laughs) And what I've noticed about that, yes, it has made me better. Hmm. It's made me better at all the things I thought I sucked at. I'm starting to get better at them, which to me is only proof that this anti-fragility idea works. It, it's right. because when I open myself up to that, because it's really uncomfortable, by the way, to stand in front of a bunch of 15 year olds when you have a master's degree in conducting and talk about all the things they're better at you than or better yeah. than you at. That's it's kind of hard. You like have to like work your way up to that. And once I did it, though. It was like this weight lifted off and I could start talking freely about the things that I, my deficiencies, and then I was able to start growing them, which I found interesting. I just think it's so, all of this is tying all together about, um, um, that uh, <laughs> go back even a, a few minutes here where we're talking about uh, the fear that we all have. It's not just our kids that are afraid to be found mm-hmm. out, you know? 
And so I think, you know, there's an old adage, the, I think it's the double or the, the AA adage, you know, the first step is admitting that what are, you have a problem or something. Right. And in a weird way, the first step towards being anti-fragile is admitting that you're fragile or admitting that, um, that you aren't the gate, as you said, a wonderful word, the gatekeeper of all things. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I do this all the time. I mean, if it's literally my mistake, uh, I will say it to the choir. Oh, that's my fault, you know, to the choir. And I think a lot of people in the choir that I direct are surprised by that because they've been used to some other things saying, oh, most conductors, they want, even if it isn't, they'll stop and not blame themselves for the error or something. Mm-hmm. You know? But just, and I, here's what happens. Uh, nothing. <laughs> That's what happens. Yeah. Did we just do it again? Nobody right. says anything. Yeah. Guess why? They're like, yeah, that's correct. It was your error and we don't hate you. Right. Let's do it again. We respect you. Nobody. More. That's right. Yeah. Just, let's just move on with life. It's called practice. So I think that's part of it is just, uh, you know, just being a human being and saying it's okay to be that. I think that's part of, part of, the battle here in this anti-fragility conversation and you know most of the other conversations that you have on your podcast and that we're having you know circle around some of these issues a little bit about Mm -hmm. just you know being a you know more human more humble more real uh less worried uh work harder um uh, you know, just caring about your craft differently, thinking deeper, all these things sort of circle around about just being better people, you know. And it gets under the psychology of the rehearsal itself, too. Yeah. You know, the, that when you're willing to open yourself up and be a more authentic person in the rehearsal, mm-hmm. which is another thing I've talked to a lot about with young teachers that ask me advice is, how quickly, and this is what I usually tell them, I said, how quickly do you think you could work towards being 100% yourself while leading a rehearsal? Meaning you don't have to put on your like professional conductor persona Mm -hmm. to go, to go lead the rehearsal. Mm -hmm. And that's usually confusing for young teachers because I think we learn the opposite of that in college. Uh, (laughs) we, we, we learn how to behave like an academic and uh and then we step step up in front of our choir and we have this persona that we 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 think they expect which you know is basically the i'll call it the bow tie persona yeah Um, sure no offense to all my missouri state friends it's cool that you wear your bow ties but this is a metaphor uh for 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 bow ties the bow tie persona which is, you know, there's nothing wrong with a bow tie, right? No, it's, it's, but it's formal. <laughs> it's formal. It, it, uh, it's front facing. Yeah. Um, meaning you're keeping your, uh, your most durable part, uh, between you and, and the choir and, and it's, and there's a separation of the, the personality. And what the reason I tell young teachers that's so important is to try to shed that for a couple reasons is, and, and you touched on it and made me think about this is that it makes you less stressed out. Mm-hmm. At, some, at some fundamental level, when you don't have to put on a mask for what many of us is seven or eight hours of our day, right? then your stress level about your job is going to start to go down because you, you, can ju- you know that your, your students are accepting you for who you are, flaws yeah. and all. Sure. And you don't have to put on this facade for, for them as they, as they go. Um, so here's my question to you. Yeah. Would, do, would you say, uh, and I, cause I want to hear about this too. You, in fact, you just started a new job, right? Yes. Yeah. Where are you now? I'm, I just moved to Des Moines, Iowa and teach at Drake university. That's what I, okay. So I, I, I knew it was Drake, but I could never remember where Drake is. I, I knew it's somewhere in the, in, in the Midwest. It is in the Midwest. We're not, yeah. we're not too, in, we're not too far away from each other. No, right? no, we're not. All the things that we've been talking about, lead you one to become more anti-fragile against the 
when you get pushed off the table and you, you as a glass moving to a new school or being in front of the next year's kids kids that you don't know that's you being pushed off the table when are you when you hit the ground what are you like do you break do you just maintain or do you become better mhm when you walk into class are you worried about how you're being perceived you know this is that i'm worried about everything coming in at all angles instead you said you know i'm not going to think about me i'm going to do what i would do at the end of the year which is everything else because you're comfortable imagine that you're comfortable at the beginning of the year why are you comfortable because of that trust and you're not worried what they think of you because you know but what if you just did you pretended that that existed at the beginning of the year yeah it's a it's a mindset choice it's a choice that yeah. is correct yeah. yes the, they the so here's i think we're we're kind of we're very successfully now i think tying these all, all these ideas all sure. together in yeah. a way in a way that i like because like i said it it's a little we're getting into the classroom now that's with, right with with how these ideas apply and one of the things i see that is one of the inspirations for me starting this show it is is that i do see a lot of teachers especially young teachers mm -hmm. now that i'm kind of on the second half of my career sloping down um that i look back and i see a lot of young teachers coming in and and they jump on the facebook group and talk about how stressed they are about their job and about how maybe this is not the right thing for them and maybe you know i don't have administrators that support me or my 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 students aren't good enough smart enough whatever to do this this or this and right and all of that and so it makes me ache a little bit because i've been really fortunate in in the job that i've had my, my most my current job but it's not, i've had other jobs that sucked so i i've been there like i know what that feels like but at the same time i feel like i am so in love with and happy with and at home in my own skin in my job mm. that I feel and I feel like there are things that I've done that were choices that helped me get there and one of the things that I my goals of having conversations like this is I I feel like they can be helpful to people that aren't feeling as secure in their own skin as it sounds like you and I are but but I, but I also don't I want people to have a growth mindset about it where it whereas if you have a fixed mindset you listen to a conversation like this you might say well well that's them that they feel good about themselves or about their conducting jobs that they have they they feel like they're they yeah. can be themselves right. but that's right. just them that's not i that couldn't apply to me well that's that's a fixed mindset and what yeah, i want to point right. out to people is all these philosophies that we've been talking about i feel like i'm a happy person in my own skin because i've studied philosophy because mm. i because i've in, i know that i'm an inherently flawed screwed up person on the inside but i'm able to do stuff that i do in in spite of that because i've learned by reading how great people have thought about thinking to help rewire my own thinking right to me, to me that's what philosophy is uh i'll add this to the to that uh i had lunch with uh donald newen uh, uh -huh. in wisconsin who weirdly uh moved to oshkosh <laughs> <laughs> for some insane reason i don't know um and he's retiring in oshkosh wisconsin and we had lunch while i was still living there and and i actually was talking about some frustrations of mine this was before the i mean it's a natural thing to do y'all okay what chris just described what you just described is a natural thing to do to have frustrations mm -hmm. with everything okay it's natural great I, I think the key here is to ask why do i have them okay that's the real question is why do i have these frustrations not how do i get even how do i get out of them it's why do i have them but so he said the key to his success and the key to his joy because he's a, he is a very joyful guy very successful was um that he always tried to make what he what his dream was happen where he was 
he didn't go, well, I'm waiting for that next one because then, because yep. over there, it's going to be better. Instead, he just assumed that this was where it was at. Mm-hmm. And he tried to make it happen there at that place. And that really moved me because I was like, well, I was thinking about, oh, I'm thinking about start doing this, but I don't know how it'll work here. Inst- and what I was experiencing was the, why am I having the frustration? Fear. Or why am I frustrated with this? Uh, selfishness. Or why am I doing this? Uh, jealousy. You know, so when you ask why am I so worried or unhappy or uh, something's going wrong in your classroom, maybe just first ask, okay, why am I feeling this way? And then what it might expose is something in you that maybe you need to do a vaccine to, you know, add a vaccine against this anti-fragility thing. Mm -hmm. And it isn't just about not complaining. It's about doing what we talked about before, thinking deeper, talking to other people, arguing about things and learning something. And maybe the biggest one that I love is, I call it throwing spaghetti on a wall. (laughs) What it is, is you just try stuff. Uh And if it fails, this is the big part. Who cares? Uh Let it go. And try again, okay? Yeah. But the the worst thing you can do is say, oh, it's, it's terrible here. X, 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 you know, X, Y, Z is happening. And I don't know what to do about it. But guess what? Nobody knows what they're doing, okay? We're all just trying stuff. And some of it really works. Mm-hmm. And then you learn. And then you do it again next time. And it either works again or it doesn't. And you just grow. It's this growth mindset thing. And, and so that's what I encourage from the... Uh, as a conclusion to this, this bit, this talk here is just to be encouraged, to be encouraged. And it isn't just Chris and I have it all together. It's the opposite. It's like, yeah, okay. We're so comfortable because we realize that we're, it's okay to fail. I think that's half of it. And it's also okay to not be the best ever. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, I'm comfortable because I've m- made so many assumptions that I'm wrong about yeah, so many sure. things and and or have just flat out told myself that I sucked about a th- at a thing or, like I said earlier, told my 15-year-old students that I suck at a thing. That sure. It's almost as if I've intentionally, and it was intentional, it, but it was as if I've um, kind of saturated myself with all those negative feet and unsure feelings uh-huh. so that so that I knew what they felt like so that when they start to creep up on me I recognize them and I and I know how to categorize them now so I like, listen to I listen to your podcast sorry to interrupt at that podcast and I do want to caveat something for the listener when you go listen to it you'll notice something though that Chris does which is he doesn't say he sucks at something in a depressive fashion there isn't like a oh woe is me it's just a <laughs> pragmatic yeah these are my strengths and weaknesses that's super important to remember there's yeah. no oh oh no i'm blah, blah no you just say here's what it is here's the reality of the situation it's fine because it can be solved yeah or maybe it can't be and i it- try to balance it with something that i'm good at yeah, great. In yeah. the same way, in the same way we do with our students, we always hear about like you got to give criticism sandwiches or whatever with like a compliment <laughs> and, and a criticism, and then you can maybe right. say something encouraging again right. afterwards. We uh, I give parfaits, criticism oh, oh, yeah. parfaits. That's that's important. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> but you know, I think I think that's something. I th- one of the reasons I think many people aren't willing to go through the process that we're describing on themselves, right? Is is partly because are so wrapped up in what other people think of us as just a, it's almost inherent in humanity that we, we get a lot too much of our self-worth from what other people think of us. And so when we start to reveal those flaws that it might lower our social stock, our professional stock, um, 
you know, it, the choir, the choir profession does it too. You know, it's the whole reason we have to put, we have to make our bios look the most amazing we can possibly make them look. And right. you gotta, you gotta right. put, you gotta put the Carnegie Hall trip your kids did, even though we paid for it going or whatever. Um, hey, if you're interested. I'm open. I'm just kidding. <laughs> right. gotta, I'm just kidding. Got to put that stuff in there because not because it's who we are. It's because it's who we feel like other people need to see that we are. Right. Sure. And, and, and so my whole system, I don't have a system in the sense, I'm not writing a book or anything, but my whole system is dismantling that for myself little piece by piece by piece to where I actually am starting as I, I, I'm about to turn 40. And so this is like kind of a turning point in my midlife crisis. You know, I, I is it's going to be fine, Chris. Don't well, worry. Yeah, no, I, I'll see. <laughs> I will see the other side of the hill. You will. <laughs> yeah. And, but I feel like I am, I'm starting to dismantle this part of myself where I now, I feel like when I talk about ha this stuff with people, like where they, where I say that I'm open about my mistakes and stuff, I, f I feel like still people don't believe me and they think that it's like sure. just me blowing smoke as sure. another way to virtue signal. But here's the reality. Oh, yeah. Right. I, I just really don't give a shit. Like I don't care. And, and that was not true about me five years ago. That was mm. not true about me 10 years ago. In fact, I think I would say that I probably only made my first mistake of my whole life at age 27 was because that was when I would admit that I made mistakes. Got it. It was for like yeah. for the first time. I was super cocky, headstrong, like um, would not show anyone any weakness ever as a younger man. And now because I'm kind of pulling these things yeah, off sure. myself one at a time, I feel like I'm you know, I'm more open. I'm more emotional with my kids. I'm more vulnerable with them. I'm more vulnerable with my students at school, with my wife. You know, it's, it's something that, that spins out into every aspect of my life. What I love about this is what's so funny is that the way that you were was fragile. And now that you're fragile, you're anti-fragile. Uh-huh. Yep. It's because it's I so awesome. Myself. You just turned it upside down. Yeah. You just turn it upside down. Yeah. I, I think people would go, ooh, He's more vulnerable. That means he's more fragile. No, no, it's exactly the opposite. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's, your chances, your chances of not you, Eric Barnum, but you, person out there. Yeah, right. Your chances of hurting my feelings because you don't like me is now almost zero. Because, and that's that's true. Because I, I've, I've crafted enough narrative in my head now to know that it's impossible for everyone to like me. It's impossible. To, people are too different. But I don't I know there are people who love me a lot. Sure. And and there and that's what I need to cater to. I need to, to foster those relationships. And and so what you say is true. It's like when I was 27, uh, I won't quite say that I was very trumpian in the sense you were that, you were i'm just saying you were fragile though right but what i say yeah. when donald when donald trump re, it, it, when i say trumpy and what i mean is his persona is somebody makes fun of him even a totally un insignificant person on twitter who makes fun of him and he freaks out right like he, he he responds and hits him back and sure you know right. this whole thing and that that is but most people would look at him and say he's so gruff and tough and you know right. like that right. but, but you're, like, that's exactly your point i think is that he is the he's fragile oh i i will say this there was some there's a guy there's a a pastor that i know his name is timothy keller lives in new york and he said the coolest thing i mean well when people ask the world or ask what's wrong with the world right now the best thing that you could say is me i'm what's wrong with the world and it's it's a it's a it's a quote. It's not okay. I'm not sure I'm what's wrong with the world, <laughs> but but if you were to say that, there's two things I'd like to add. One, if you were to say that, it's an attitude and a mindset thing. Okay, if you're it's it is a look. Again, I'm not afraid to be seen to be a fraud. Okay, I am just. It's okay. And, and I'll start with myself instead of pointing the finger everywhere. Else. I'm just going to start with me. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. That's again, like when you're conducting and it's your fault, it's okay to say, 
everybody, that was my fault. Let's do it again. That's what that means. Everything was. A, so it's a mind. The second thing, though, that I want to add very carefully would say there's a layer that I add personally, which is I sometimes don't even trust what I'm saying about myself, too. Yeah. So it isn't just, I don't, it's not, it's okay what everybody says, because I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, great. Sticks and stones can break my bones, it's fine. But I'm anti-fragile, so they will just make me stronger. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh -huh. But I found that I lie to myself a lot sometimes. And so I need to protect myself from that, too, by carefully vaccinating myself against myself sometimes, too. That's a different podcast for another day, but it adds a complexity. But I be careful to sometimes not believe. It's not just even believing your own hype. It's about believing what you think about yourself because it might not be true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I, I think that's external also. I think that works both yeah, ways. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, it's the assumption, the assumption at all times that the thing you claim could be wrong is right. is so important to to doing the opposite of that which is finding truth because you, even though you you might say even when you reach it something that's new to you as a truth you are mm. still going to put it through that ringer of well i could still be wrong mm. and ironically through that anti fragile this is now anti-fragility of the intellect that we're sure. talking about. Yes, sure. Is that is that you are more likely to be filtering away, pulling up, pulling out your implicit biases, pulling out your con your confirmation bias tendency, which everyone is subject to. But I find and, this and at and and, and uh, straw men and uh -huh. all these other illogical fallacies along the way too that you're we all fall prey to. Right. Yeah. And, and I think it's what, what I've noticed is that even on like topics of just very cold and clean academic type discussions in, in the choral world where I might have a contrarian opinion to what I feel like is mo what most people believe about this, the way the voice works or the way um, we choose our intonation methods within an ensemble or I mean there's all kinds of things that I think that my, my local colleagues call the months brand of doing things that so like everyone else so doesn't believe what sure. I believe okay and, and so and so the way I think of it though is I I have conversations with people about why I think a choir should do x y and z and they interpret that as well he just has his it's his way or the highway and I'm like, well, no, actually, the reason I think what I think is because I've put everything I think through a ringer that is the assumption that I don't know anything that I'm talking about, and I'm going to go try mm -hmm. to find the science behind it. I'm going to go try to find the research that's the most current. I'm going to go try to find uh, whatever it is that will prove me wrong, and I'm going to try to formulate a new opinion based on that. And so when I finally have a conversation with a colleague, I've kind of already gone through that process. Sure. And, and I'm, and so I, I, I have an assistant at the high school, uh, and she's one of my former students and we're starting to have some of these conversations where like, I want you, you to come here and work as a colleague. Like I'm not going to make all the decisions. I want you to make some decisions, but if you have a, an idea that is different than how I've decided we're going to do it, you're going to have to prove it. You're going to have to go through the ringer I went through, which mm -hmm. is if you're going to say that we're going to now do um, a different, um, let's say I'll just pick something dumb. We're going to make move to law based minor instead of dough based minor. Okay, okay. Let's have that conversation, but you're going to have to prove to me that your way is better than my way. Well, let me ask you a question though, to challenge you. Yeah. What if there's a possibility that some ideas and they're not all that in the world, believe me, I, I am one that believes that truth exists totally and absolutely. but. What if there are some cases where the paradox of both and exists instead of either or? Yeah. That it's right. And I think that you believe that. Like if you, that it isn't even circumstantial, is that both can work 
at any given time. And that's probably part of the problem is that when people go, it's his way or the highway, that doesn't mean that you can't fully believe in your idea and it works perfectly. But the other, some guy on the other side of the country has this amazing thing happening and it also works. And then you talk to him like years later and you say, how did you do that? And it was exactly the opposite of you. Right. You know, that's, that's possible. So I think, but that being said, I would suspect though, that that guy on the other side of the country that's doing this is doing the same sort of thinking methods that you're doing. They're not just willy nilly just happening by chance on it. So that what was so good is that the, the, the pro again, I love, I think, I think the main thing we're talking about tonight is processes. Uh -huh. you know, the process is is important is not is even more important the process that you go through to come to a decision the process of becoming anti fragile the process of um gaining humility or stuff like this is super important yeah. as important as the outcome even you know because the outcome results from a particular type of process right well and and that's yeah and that's kind of that's actually so much of a better way of saying what i was trying to say before which is that if i'm going to tell my colleague that we would i would entertain switching to a different type of reading system yeah minor but you're going to have to show me not not that your idea is the superior one and is the truth one yeah right but but that if we're going to switch to to a new thing, then I want I'm going to want to see that you've gone through the same process I went to 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 get to my correct answer, right? Which one? Which was the one that were made for me? Because I don't want to make decisions based on, well, I saw somebody do that on Facebook, and that's what I want to do now. Like right. it's going to have to be more than that. It's going to have to be right. Okay, so what? what principles of physics are we dealing with here? What principles mm. of psychology are we dealing with here? That's going to make this a good choice. Let, you know, let's, let's dive into that. Let's talk about the music theory. Let's talk about vowel formants and sure. all the different things that play when you're teaching kids to listen to music and hear themselves and all this kind of stuff. So the, uh, so I think as long as there is, that's why I like the way you say it, because as long as there's a process that you can kind of apply to like consistently yeah. In, your, in your reasoning, then you are more, way more likely to arrive at maybe not flawlessly reasoned because no one can flawlessly reason, but closer and closer to consistent reasoning. That's going to make you less stressed out about your, you're, you're going to have less anxiety about what's coming next in your life. Right. Right. You start to trust a process. That's right. Notice we're coming full circle again. And, and weirdly by the processes that you're talking about, you're doing that same thing. Thing. you're stripping away things you're just mm -hmm. stripping away things you're gaining more and more the truth of the matter you know whatever you're thinking about and you know less literature the truth of the matter is that we should probably program better <laughs> mm -hmm. period so I'm, I'm just saying like that's just an example that i bring up all the time uh so yeah. You can apply the process, this I, uh, all these processes of anti fragility to, and this process of stripping away. You know, again, we're going all the way circling back to saying we should just be thinking more. Yeah. Shouldn't we? Yeah. Just think more. Just think more about it. Don't respond so much. Uh, don't. I, we're just, I think we're responsive. And that's what we said before. We're responding to what other people think of us. We're, doing, you know, we're we're worrying about everything around us. What if we just were more thoughtful, more engaged in doing what we're we're being paid to do, which is love kids, teach them to do something that we love and they love, and that's it. Thank you, as always, for sticking around to the end of an episode. I am glad you're here. And even though this episode is a little bit different than the ones normal, I promise we're going to get back into some kind of a normal routine soon with the show. Uh, last week's episode was a little bit different. This episode's a little bit different. Uh, but I've got some awesome interviews coming up this weekend that you're going to hear even as soon as next week. I can't tell you who they are because you're not on the Patreon feed. If you go over to patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy, I'm going to drop those announcements in right after I'm done with the recording, who I will be talking to this weekend and who you will be hearing from very soon. And of course, don't forget to enter those Coralosophy checkout codes 
in all those websites. That really helps the show. And of course, like, share, uh, send the episodes privately if you're embarrassed about all the problematic topics or whatever it is, but just spread the word. The show is continuing to grow and it's, it's growing because of you. Thanks a lot.